Welcome to my video I'm calling A Model and a Story. For my model, I have chosen AMT's 140A scale F-16A, which I will paint with the Arizona Air National Guard fin flesh as it was in 1994. The tail number I have chosen is 800486. I will start this video with a narration and illustrate as best I can with the tools available to me to describe the events that led up to the crash of this jet and the tragic loss of the pilot. In the next portion, I will show my steps building this kit and the techniques I used in detailing the model. Along with that, I will speak of my memories recovering wreckage and debris at the crash site of 486 in 1994. I found a map I drew out at the time marking areas of items I found or saw. I have transcribed this information onto a geodesic map of the mountain to enhance my explanation of the recovery efforts. I have redacted some information concerning human remains and personal items discovered, and I will not discuss these topics either. Finally, I will introduce video I shot during a visit to the crash site about 20 years after the accident. On February 28, 1994, three F-16s from the Arizona Air National Guard 162nd Fighter Wing depart from Tucson International Airport, runway 11 left. It is 1335 local time. The jets are from the 140A squadron within the 162nd wing and are designated Thumper Flight. Their task today is to perform an air combat maneuvering flight training mission. They are designated the call signs Thumper 1, Thumper 2, and Thumper 3. Their destination is the Morency Military Operating Area, about 100 miles northeast of Tucson, Arizona. The mission will be terminated after an F-16 crashes 5.5 miles southwest of Duncan, Arizona. Thumper 1 is the flight lead flown by an instructor pilot with over 3,500 flight hours. 1,700 hours are in the F-16 with 950 hours as an instructor. Thumper 3 is also an IP with over 1,100 flying hours, of which 950 are in the F-16 and 110 hours as an instructor. Thumper 2 is flown by student pilot cadet 2nd Lieutenant Julian Benneker of the Royal Netherlands Air Force. He has over 330 hours flight time with almost 60 in the F-16. He has been training in Arizona since October 1993. During the pre-flight briefing for this mission, he is noted to have a relaxed and positive attitude. Benneker has been struggling during his training and is under increased pressure to improve his performance. In fact, this flight is a repeat of a flight he failed three days before. Initially, Thumper 2 with Benneker loses sight of the others during the first engagement and the three F-16s reset to try again. They form up in echelon formation at 21,000 feet with Thumper 3 in the lead. Thumper 1 is 6,000 feet away at Thumper 3's right 5 o'clock in an offensive position, and similarly, Thumper 2 is 6,000 feet away at Thumper 1's right 5 o'clock at an offensive support position. They are traveling at 420 knots indicated airspeed. In the next engagement, Thumper 3 initiates a defensive hard 7G right turn and Thumper 1 engages. Thumper 2 pulls up and to the right to secure a higher altitude. Thumper 3 begins flying a defensive circle. The fight is now lower and to the left of Thumper 2. Benneker radio calls to engage and is cleared by Thumper 1. Thumper 1 and 3 lose sight of Benneker as he is in their 6 o'clock position. However, Benneker does not engage. Thumper 3 observes Thumper 2 now southwest of the flight circle and sees Benneker begin a high G turn pointing his nose towards Thumper 3. It is now expected Benneker will perform a split S to join the fight and come up behind and below Thumper 3. Thumper 2 begins his split S. He is looking over his right shoulder looking down at Thumper 3 and 1 looking for an entry point to join the fight. Benneker then pulls a maximum G-force turn into the nose down vertical position of the split S. However, Thumper 2 does not pull up to level out. Altitude. Altitude. As Thumper 2 approaches the training floor of 14,000 feet, the instructor in Thumper 3 radios, 2, pull up. There is no response. Warning, warning. 
Warning, warning, caution, caution. Thumper 3 calls again four seconds later. 2, pull it up. Thumper 2 still does not respond. There is no change in the flight attitude of the F-16. The aircraft is accelerating towards the ground at maximum afterburner, and there is no attempted ejection. Altitude. Altitude. At 13.57 local time, Thumper 2 impacts Flat Top Mountain at 5,100 feet elevation at supersonic speed. Lieutenant Benneker is killed instantly. Looking at AMT's F-16 kit here, it is not particularly well detailed and there's not a lot of parts. If you consider all the options and even the uh, wing fins on the side one, there's only a total of 60 parts. Uh, this is definitely for a beginner uh, to start out. Unless you want more of a challenge as an experienced builder, you can add on a lot of custom details, I'm sure, and make the model pop more. The top fuselage comes as a single one piece. As you can see, the horizontal stabilizers are already attached, and the top portion of the nose radome is also attached. Uh, so it just takes a little filing uh, at the runner points to get this portion uh, ready to go. This kit does not have any recessed panel lines. In fact, they're thin raised lines, and so the use of a traditional wash to make these lines stand out more is uh, not going to work. We're going to have to come up with something else. Uh, this model had a little flash on it here and there, which is unusual. I haven't seen that for years, but uh, it's not too bad. If we look closely, you can see those raised panel lines instead of recessed lines. And in fact, one of the first sections I found at the wreckage site was uh, in this area where the uh, fuel cell panel lines are, as you can see in this photo. And this is the approximate location I recovered that piece. Most of the pieces we were finding initially were little metal nuggets uh, that were fragmented from the aircraft due to the high speed impact. There was a large area where the 20 millimeter shells ended up and they looked much like this. Uh, a lot were in pristine condition and looked like they could almost be put back up on the rack. We walked shoulder to shoulder in long lines to go up the mountain uh, looking for debris. Anytime we came across the 20 millimeter shells, we had to yell out EOD for the explosive ordnance guys to pick up. Uh, they were afraid any static electricity we had on our bodies might set off the rounds. The cockpit consoles have no detail, so they're relying on decals to bring out those kind of uh, features. Unfortunately, it looks backwards here because it's more gray panel and black knobs, and it should be more black panel and gray knobs. Looking at the Happy Hooligans emblem, I can use that for dimensions for my Arizona state flag since this model will be too small for me to actually hand paint it or, or airbrush it out. This is just application of those panel decals to the uh, consoles of the cockpit. I would say that uh, during the recovery there were lots of sections of metal that uh, you could tell where the outer skin with the gray paint and then the zinc chromate and sometimes the underside uh, gloss white depending on where it was on the aircraft but every piece was bent and looked like somebody had taken a hammer and beat on it uh, quite extensively and there was uh, of course extensive uh, scratching and paint chipping uh, beyond the normal wear and tear you would assume on a uh, fighter jet. Since this model is going to be closed canopy I'm not too worried about the detail because it won't be uh, easily visible once the uh, glass is put on top of the uh, fuselage. And this is a quick overview of the cockpit as it's completed. Uh, not great, but uh, uh, again, it's not going to be well seen anyway, so I'm not too concerned about it. I did do a little wash on the seat, however. One problem with putting the cockpit on, it only has one attach point here on the back. It doesn't really contact the sides or the front of the upper fuselage. So in order to reinforce it, I'm going to glue some sprue on each side so it doesn't collapse during construction or subsequent to the construction.
Another problem I noted with the cockpit is that there's these blank open spaces here towards the front by the glare shield. Uh, there should be some black paneling here, but I noticed if I put the uh, canopy frame on uh, after dry fitting that it actually covers this up, so it should be well hidden anyway. If you look where my thumb is, this is where the uh, hydraulic reservoir pumps are, uh, one on each side, A and B system. In the debris field, the first major system item I found that was recognizable was a reservoir pump such as this one. And this is shown on the map in the kind of green blue uh, lettering here. It's time to cut the bottom fuselage. Uh, I think the biggest piece that was recognizable of course was the engine core. Uh, it was just slightly outside of the burn area. Uh, even though it had been a few days since the crash, uh, you could smell the jet fuel and there were areas that were still smoking a little and when I picked up portions of the gearing for the 20 millimeter cannon, it was actually still uh, hot to the touch. Uh, if you look closely at the aerial photograph of the uh, crash site, you can see the engine core uh, about where I put it on the map too, so my recollection and my map are quite accurate uh, considering it's been so long. And I remember we had a three foot by maybe six to eight foot uh, plywood box that was laid out to put the uh, barrels of the 20 millimeter Gatling gun in there and sections of it were broken. Uh, it looked like uh, bent rubber hose. It didn't look like uh, actual metal anymore. It looked like rubber hoses. One interesting find was a panel that went over the rotary actuators uh, near the leading edge flaps of the wings. Uh, we take these planes apart during phase maintenance and a lot of times they'll have the tail number stenciled on the inside of the panel so that they can be matched correctly with the uh, jet uh, so they don't get mixed up with uh, the wrong jet during all the phases of all the different jets. However, on this leading edge flap, we found that it had been marked for aircraft 790044. So these parts are interchangeable. It was no big deal, but it was kind of interesting to see that the panel got onto the wrong airplane. Though it is possible that they officially cannibalized it from the other plane. I would say the crash site is very rough terrain, and I did actually make it all the way up to the top. A lot of people fell out before they got up to the uh, impact point, but uh, I was told uh, measurement-wise that the crater was about 50 feet wide by about 8 or 9 feet deep, and some guys were digging down, seeing if they could uh, recover any wreckage that may have been uh, submerged into the dirt. Uh, I remember seeing piles of those nuggets uh, and uh, half a dummy Sidewinder missile was uh, on top of one of those piles. At the beginning of the day, we had been issued gloves and canvas bags to collect uh, all the bits of uh, debris and wreckage that we could find that would fit in the bag. And then uh, once in a while, we'd all collect it up on a pallet, and a helicopter would uh, swoop in and uh, pick up that pallet and then bring it to a flatbed down towards the uh, base of the mountain. Here's the upper and lower fuselage put together, and I've uh, taped it with Tamiya tape to kind of hold it together. Uh, we have this natural seam line to make the leading edge flap, which is very nice. Unfortunately, it breaks off and makes a right angle with the trailing edge of the wing, which is something else we're going to have to fill in and sand out. And we're also going to have to extend the uh, seam of the leading edge to make it uh, more accurate as to the uh, look of the aircraft. As you saw from the story portion, Lieutenant Benneker suffered G-lock. I did experience this phenomenon once during an aerobatic flight on an extra 300L with an F-18 pilot. We were doing about uh, 8 to 8.5G and a half G turn when I remember 7 seconds into it I was graying out and thinking I needed to bear down more. But I G-locked in a split second before I knew it. As I began regaining consciousness I was thinking, wasn't I on a flight? I don't remember landing or coming home. Then I saw we were nose down towards the ground realizing I was still in flight and boy did I want to grab the controls and recover that aircraft. This was all in a second but it felt like 30 seconds or more. Very scary. Going back to the model I'm cutting off pieces here to get them ready for paint. If I can discipline myself uh, to finish this model I should get it done uh, fairly quickly uh, even though this video is very short uh, if you're viewing it relatively speaking it's probably taken me three or four weeks to get to this point. I'm a very slow model builder, plus I'm usually busy with work and uh, doing other things, so this is kind of a luxury to uh, work on models. I can work on those seam lines on the flapper on uh, using a combination of the X-Acto knife and the uh, sponge uh, sandpaper. 
the Air Guard trains many pilots, uh, including the U.S., of course, but also many foreign nations uh, in our portfolio of allies. Uh, particularly one of my favorites, we're always dealing with the uh, Netherlands pilots. The Dutch were always very friendly and uh, really easy to work with. Uh, they had a very good uh, attitude, and they were also very uh, humorous. I think they're... they're sense of humor is very similar to American sense of humor so uh, the relations we had were always good and so I think that's why they were one of our favorites at the unit and next is gluing the halves of the uh, main wheels for the main gear and I'm gonna mix a little XF2 flat white and a little dark yellow to uh, make the color for the inside of the engine nozzle and fan uh, if you ever look down an engine nozzle of uh, F-16, it's almost a light sandy white uh, interspersed with, of course, the uh, burn marks from the uh, hot exhaust. So you get uh, interesting patterns if you ever look down one of those. It's uh, almost like artwork. Next, I'm going to apply silver aluminum paint on the outer surface of the uh, nozzle. And I'm going to do a little wash on it later on to bring out the the veins of the uh, nozzle. To extend the leading edge flap line I've taped it off to make a straight line and I'm going to etch it with this triangular file to deepen that line and be able to put a wash in it later. And to clean it up I'm going to use an X-Acto knife to deepen that crevice and also clean out some of that uh, excess plastic that's left over from the filing. And then I began doing the painting of the white areas of the landing gear doors and the wheels as you saw. Now to black paint on the main wheels. Uh, later on I'll do some wash within the uh, hub there to simulate hydraulic fluid leaks in the uh, brake soot. I began placing the flaperons on the wings. Uh, the left wing had enough friction on the two sides to hold it into place and then glue it. Uh, the right side had too much spacing and it would fall out, so I had to tape it in here to glue it in. As you can see, I have the cockpit uh, already protected uh, prior to the overall painting I'm going to start doing. As an avionics flight technician, there was always a real fear of dropping something in the cockpit because we spent a lot of time there uh, doing operational checks and troubleshooting. And you would just have your heart sink if you hear tink, tink, tink as you drop something. And sometimes you would never know where it went. So uh, we would use uh, magnets and mirrors and mechanical fingers to try to retrieve it. But sometimes it would just could not be found and we called it fodding out the aircraft. So it would have to be towed into the hangar the canopy would have to be taken off and the ejection seat tilted and raised to hopefully find that part. And in worst case scenario, we would actually have the seat pulled out. And that was a big headache for everybody because uh, just the maintenance taking it out and putting it back in and all the operational checks we would have to do after putting it back together uh, was really a lot of extra work. One thing we did do to prevent that was to lay out uh, paper towels and stuff to catch anything that might drop like a screw or a cotter pin or a washer. But every once in a while I would find a way to just get past all that stuff and create a problem. So that's something I don't miss about working on fighter jets, but I miss all the camaraderie, the excitement of working on a jet, all the things you get to see and do is just uh, can't be beat uh, working on a flight line. Another thing I miss is doing radar checks at the end of the flight line at night to, to watch the other jets take off. Uh, watching that afterburner glow come out of the engine nozzle is just like looking at a lightsaber from Star Wars and the sound was just fantastic. And if you're sitting in the cockpit doing the radar checks, you're like inside a Christmas tree with all the lights and the blinking and it's just uh, a beautiful sight. And I lightly scrape away the glue overruns time to get to the paintwork so we start with the pre-shading and we're going to follow those panel lines and once we get our final base coat on then we'll get those variations in the colors and the shade of the overall surface of the model so we get that realistic larger scale effect I start with the underside of the uh, aircraft to pre-shade um, since it'll be easier, I'm expecting fewer lines. Unfortunately, even though I'm using a light touch on the trigger, 
and uh, trying to keep the uh, flow of the uh, paint narrow. It's much wider than I'm wanting here, so I'm kind of overrunning the areas, and hopefully I can touch that up with the final base coat and uh, reduce this kind of overspray effect I'm getting right now. Since I'm now expecting to have to do a lot of adjustment uh, with the base coat filtering, I'm going to make these lines darker than I normally would, so that'll give me a little more room to uh, make changes and get the uh, overall look of the model uh, where I want it. Starting with the upper fuselage, I'll be expecting more lines, and since I can't get the flow of the paint as narrow as I'd like, you'll see that I'm going to have a lot of merging here. It's almost a big black blotch in some areas. So I'm kind of trying to figure out how I'm going to reduce this effect with the base coat without losing that shading and filtering effect that I want. The biggest problem area is at the hump with all the fuel cell panels. As I continue to highlight each line you see that there is more and more of this blotching effect and merging. If you look at that third bump behind the cockpit, that's the upper tack end antenna, and that reminds me of a story when we were over the Pacific in a KC-135. Uh, we were fueling one of our F-16s, and the refuel boom actually hit the tack end antenna and broke it off. So there's just a tiny little stub on the top of the jet, and so we already had a maintenance job to do as soon as we landed. Next we go to the external tanks, and I'm following uh, panel lines here as well. Also, I'm going to highlight these attach points of the pylon to the external tank. I think that'll give us a nice shadow effect. To get up on the wings, we'd use a basic home ladder, but often they weren't uh, handy and nearby, so it was so much more convenient to jump up onto these long external tanks if they were attached. You just sit up on it, stand up on the tank, and then step up onto the wing. We weren't supposed to do that, but it was so much easier at times. I start the base coat on the vertical tail, and since I don't have much control, since it's uh, such a small scale model, I've set the PSI low on my airbrush, and I'm just kind of giving it an overall uh, spray and letting the darker portions of that pre-shade uh, flow through the uh, base coat. And we're getting a nice random effect in the tones of the gray, so it's kind of working out here better than I expected. I continue with a broad spray technique on the external tanks as well and let the pre-shade come through. I'll start off with the bottom rather than the top so I can gauge how well this is going to work out since I'll get a better contrast between the lighter color and the pre-shading than I would at the top. And with the underside, uh, it's working out fairly well. I'm getting a nice type of random weathering effect on the bottom. And onto the upper fuselage using a darker shade of gray. But of course, we still want to let that pre-shade show through in certain parts to get that random effect. Uh, the changes in color, tones, and brightness and darkness. So we continue with a broad spray over the fuselage and have the pre-shade slowly come through and compensate for that uh, merging effect that we were getting. This is an oil wash that I'm going to highlight the rudder and uh, try to do a pin wash on these raised panel lines to try to get them to be more distinct and try to improve the detail on this model. Next I go to the wing external fuel tanks and try to get that to uh, highlight better with these little lines, uh, again using a pin wash. It shows nicely at the pylon connection point to the tank. I did a wash all over the uh, main fuselage here, and after I cleaned it up, it didn't really show up very well. But it kind of darkened the airplane, gave it a little 
bit of a dirty look, so it only helped in that sense. And here's a disaster. These decals look light on the sheet, but when you actually apply them, they're actually much darker, so they almost blend in with my paint job, so you can barely see them. And this is the incorrect color contrast that we're looking for, so I may have to get an aftermarket set of decals to improve the look. So this is not going to work. And this is just a quick shot of the underside, putting it all together with the external tank. So almost done with the construction. I'm going to do what I can to finish up the model while I wait for some aftermarket decals since I can't do grayscale with my custom decals on my printer because it's just actually really black dots that are further and further apart depending on the grayscale so it doesn't really work on a model. And once the Arizona state flag is complete I'll put the scripted Arizona next followed by the Air National Guard emblem followed by the tail number 80486. For the rest of the kit, I'm just going to use the decal set that came with the model. Uh, the only thing I have to wait for is the U.S. insignia emblems and the air refuel markings uh, to come into the mail so I can finish this model. But I'll go ahead and continue putting on the rest of the decals. And here's the tail completed. It looks pretty good here. This is a decent shot of the upper fuselage. You can see those variations with the shading that I did. And if you can look closely, you can see some of the oil streaks I put on the leading edge flaps to enhance the weathering look and use look. The problem with this model is I found a large gap is present once you put the vertical tail on and you're going to have to put putty in to fill it in. So this is a bad fit and uh, not well engineered. Also here and there on the model you notice things are not quite to scale so it's kind of fudged. For my final detail, I'm using oil-based paint around the F2 and forward and F reservoir tank panels. We get this normal seepage around them, and it usually contaminates with dust and dirt to make this nice outline. To accentuate the panel lines, I'm using pure oil-based paint rather than a diluted version, and I'm going to run perpendicular with a cotton swab to help that paint build up along those lines, and then use a clean cotton swab to clean the center of each of these panels so that only the edges of each of these panels is accentuated. As you can see we have a lot of panel lines to do and it's going to take a lot of cotton swabs but I'm hoping that uh, we get the effect that we want since we don't have the recessed lines which would have been easier to uh, highlight with a regular wash. Okay, we're almost done, and I'm going to do the final reveal after these shots here, and then if you stay tuned, you'll see my visit to the actual crash site, which I mentioned was 20 years after the actual accident. And thank you for watching, and I hope you found this at least entertaining, if not interesting, and we'll see you later. You can see it's very tall grass covering up 
lots of boulders like these. Very hard going, hard to step around. Let me try to get a better shot with the tripod now. Less than three quarters of a mile. And it's taken us over an hour, about an hour and 10 minutes to get this far. It's so long to go. This terrain is not for the faint hearted. And panning over, there's the cross. <laughs> 